Losers Bracket Final. Off we go. Infernal Shrines is our first map in the best of three series. We are in the fourth qualifier for the Banshee Cup, everybody. And we got the Svenska Pensioners against the Space Goofs. So, let's go. We got... Yeah, they had to sub somebody in, so Banana Age. Apparently, Cure was supposed to play with the blue team today. But when he logged on to European Battle Night, he had, in he had insane problems with ping. And they went for a sub, so they're playing with Banana Age here today. That is subbing in for Cure instead. Over on the side of the Space Goofs, we have Dequaza in this tournament, which is obviously quite fun. And I'm really looking forward to see a few more games with him. Just generally awesome to have these guys back. Now, as mentioned before, this is the fourth qualifier out of six in total. Teams accumulate points as they are participating in qualifiers and move through the bracket towards the final rounds. At the end of the six qualifiers, the points are uh, added together and the teams at the top of the leaderboard make it into the playoffs themselves where they are playing for $2,500 of prize money. All sponsored by Psygif, by Kevin. Again, the heroes of the storm, Sugar Daddy, as I'm not tired to point out. And... Thanks to him, we have more awesome games coming in here. So now we get bans on Jojo and uh, Hogger with Lucio getting banned. I mean, obviously, if you're the Space Goofs, you have to adjust a bit how you're banning now since Banana Age is subbing in. So you have to at least account for that. And they're already targeting some of the supports here. Not like Banana is only going to play support for the team. There's actually a chance that in this case, he doesn't have to. That instead, Maka continues to play support. Banana Age is playing some damage, for example. So there's always a chance of that. I'm not quite sure how they are arranging it. But the first thing that we're getting is Skook coming in with Diablo. So, okay. Dibbles are the first pick on Infernalize. Never bad. Every time that you fight on the shrine, you have so many walls that you can just bully somebody into. And Diablo, as the OG bully, can just like pummel them into the wall. Blaze for Dequaza. <laughs> Now he has to play him again. <laughs> yeah, okay. Dequaza is back to his go-to hero. And we have a Chiasega on my F. We've seen both of those already, but this is going to be nice. If you have a tether into a jet propulsion stun, glorious. If you can follow that up with, I don't know, Stukov, for example, I mean, even better. So we'll see what they decide to go for with as a support, but Stukov making an appearance is definitely a possibility. We get Hanzo and we get Leoric, so the janitor is in the house and is going to try to take out the trash and swift around a bit. Yeah, Ban's kicking now and should be fun. But yeah, it's kind of cool to see plays played by Dequaza simply because well, Dequaza has taken a bit of a break, so now he's back for the tournament. But I still remember that in the offline events in Miami specifically, he was playing plays every single game. And he was asked at some point, like, can't you play anything else? And he's just like, I want to. But they're not banning Blaze, they're not taking it away from me, and it is the best hero, so I have to pick it. And you could really see the despair at some point where it's like, please, ban him, do something, like, give me something else to play on the side lane. And I think then he uh, <laughs> he started to move into the Haka a bit. But having him now with the first pick Blaze once more, it's just kind of funny. At least in that context. Final man, after Junkrat got the axe, now we're having Tyriel eliminated. Yeah, and that allows still for some pretty neat picks over here for the Space Goofs. Personally, I want to see who's playing support for the blue team, if it's going to be Maka or if it's going to be Banana Age. It might honestly be a little bit dependent on, be a bit dependent on what kind of damage dealer that they're playing. I mean, if Maka, for example, wants to play Tracer, if Mephisto needs to be busted out, it could be that he's going to be the one. Ooh, and we get Uther, possibly as a main tank, together with Vala now. All right, things just got interesting. Uther, Vala, didn't think that would be busted out now in Infernal Shrines, given how they started into the draft. So, for the blue team, what's the final pick, Charles? Who is playing support for them? Marker? Banana? What's the damage dealer? The Mephisto here? The Mephisto, okay. Then it's Banana on Ana, because Banana's Ana is pretty bananas, and he knows that when he plays Ana, everybody is going to uh, be scared of Mephisto with an Ana boost, because, yeah, ban Ana was not an option. I mean, they could have banned Ana when they saw that uh, Banana was playing for the blue team, but they weren't sure if Banana would really 
play Ana, so they didn't ban Ana and Banana picked Ana, so yeah. And Uberag has the final pick, that means more stuns, Vala only has one support next to her, but Mephisto is back, Maka playing one of his OG damage dealers, and ba uh, Banana on Ana, so uh, the nano boost is guaranteed, and this should be kind of fun. In front friends, everybody, game number one. Game number one in the loser's bracket final. On the left side, Gia on Anzo, Max Passion on Leoric. Everybody is going bananas when Banana plays Ana. And a round of applause for that. Skok on Diablo and Maka on Mephisto. On the right side of the map, play with a Nubarak for the space goofs. They had quite the run here. Gia Seca is going on my F and X-Ray with Vala auto attack despite the fact that he has only a single support. But a triple frontline at least. Dequaza playing Blaze and then Yazu coming in on Uther to try and empower all of the plays that Vala is guaranteed to make or at least trying to make. Gambit quest on level 1 means you die, you lose some auto attack speed. So that's going to be the name of the game for a while that the blue team is going to try and take her down and remove those auto attack speed advantages that she gets with her Gambit quest. Because if she makes it with decent stacks into level 16, gets Manticore and has good stacks and hasn't lost any auto attack speed, then your front line is going to disappear within seconds. And that's something that particularly Diablo is going to be worried about. For very good reason too. Oftentimes when you see Vala being played as a double support that gets played with her. Trying to make sure that she doesn't die. But yeah, either way. Right now we have a grenade build for Ana. We got uh, the Skull Missile build for Maka, and it's actually kind of fun to... It, it, honestly, it just feels right to see Maka on Mephisto. It just feels right. Maka is the first one that played Mephisto regularly on the European server. That was years and years and years ago. And then at some point, I think there was a tournament in Korea where tons of people played Mephisto, and all of a sudden you saw a couple of European players also start to adapt to it, and by now it's just a thing. But when it came to tournament matches, Maka, a pioneer on that hero, and he made it to an extent where he was consistently banned out, specifically when he played him on Infernal Shrine. So that he's now doing it again here. Makes just perfect sense to me. It's definitely gonna be fun. Definitely gonna be really nice. Already the attacks, they keep on coming. Blue team dropping a bit low here on Mayev, but the tether is in. Vala is still weaving those auto attacks in, but Mayev! Oh yeah, she's dead. Gets Hanzo. Gets Hansold, and that is first blood for the blue team. So a good start for the Swedish team. Plus one Frenchie. And yeah, Vala sitting at 22 stacks. It's not too bad for the opening. So Vala, if she is able to get a couple of quest rewards as all of this continues, I mean, then great for her. But now they had to fall back after the last fight. I honestly think that they got a bit lucky also losing only one of their heroes because this could have been so much worse for them as things continued but camps are now coming up as the objective is about to be announced we're talking about a shrine in the middle of the map that is spawning first lots of aoe of course for both of these teams and each is taking the shaman camp to apply the added pressure onto the top lane in particular no globals in this game though nobody rocking a global no false set no dehaka so you can't just sit on the side lane longer and try and get big value out of this and we have arsenal as a level four choice no death dealer so x-ray going for a bit of a hybrid version with his vala play because he wants to adapt to the map i assume obviously gonna use that on the shrine fights as much as he can and arsenal can be a really powerful tool if you're going to just carpet the shrine, make sure that you're getting damage in against not only the uh, shrine minions, but also against the opponent's team. So, something to definitely bust out every now and then. We'll see how it works out for them. Top side, a bit of an attack happening against players as they are starting to apply additional pressure here. But Anubarak is now diving in as the team is trying to help out with additional stuns from Uther and Blaze. They obviously have a pretty neat follow-up. But there's also more pew 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 coming from Bananas Ana as he's getting one sleep dart in after another. And while they are battling it out topside for an early level 7, the rest of the team hasn't been too lazy. They've been straight on the shrine getting a 21 stack lead for them. Yeah, by now with Hot Pursuit also. But 24 to 5 stacks is already a good indicator on where things stand. Blue team is behind and has to catch up. Whereas the red team is now trying to lock in the Mortar Punisher, which will be the first one in this game. 
Maev is still not here, though. He was getting the experience at the bottom of the map, waited for one additional minion wave, and is now moving towards the top. But it was, this was a 4 versus 5 for a long time. Diablo stunned into the wall, follow up by Hanzo. They want the kill on a new Barak. They can't quite get it. Vala in the meantime, going for Leo and getting the drop on him. Hanzo died too. So that's two kills against the blue team, and they gotta fall back here. More and more likely that the team in blue is going to uh, have to give this one up. Yeah. This is not looking good. 37 to 23 is where we're at right now. And the first Punisher goes indeed over to the Space Goops. 56 stacks for Vala. She made it out of the fight before dying. So was generally well done. Good timing on them too with all of that they put together here. But now the bait over the wall as the attacks continue. A bit of a leading experience in the meantime for the red team as they are playing this one out. And yeah, they might get a lot more than I expected them to. That's the wall gone and half the HP on the fort itself. Not too bad. A few of the heroes, and they steal the camp too. A few of the heroes were still at the bottom of the map, Hanzo in particular. <laughs> Gia. Oh, yeah, Diablo. He gets caught and killed. 68 stacks for Vala. She obviously loves situations like this, where the opponent just overextends with a single hero a tiny little bit, and you can use him as a pin cushion, get more stacks on your order attacks. And yep, yeah, this is what continues also with Marke here, who gets murdered. Marke is down, that results in the fort getting destroyed. Vala is sitting at 71, so she's still a bit away from the second quest reward on her level 1, but she hasn't died yet. Keeps also the hot pursuit stacks up, and things are just generally looking pretty good for them. Blue team still defending. Still trying to do their best here, but honestly, they're a little bit pinned down. They don't have level 10. They can't do a whole lot. That leading experience on the shrine and then getting those kills and taking a few more structures and heroes down, that really accelerated the experience progress of the red team. Finally, with level 10 in the hands of their opponents, there's now a chance for the blue team to fight back into this. But yeah, already a bit of a setback for sure. So we get Dragon's Arrow as usual. We get the uh, Nano Boost and on top of that for Mephisto we have the Dorans of Fate. So with that combo of Ana and Mephisto, they can now start to make a couple of plays here. And can really try and see how deep they can go with this. And if that allows them to, for example, take Vala down and take some of that order attack speed that I was mentioning earlier away from her. Choke point fights are also something that should probably avoid it if you're on the red team. So there's already the Durance of Hate being used. You gotta be super careful that Diablo doesn't use that little choke point as a bit of a barbecue preparation alley to just murder them where they stand. Particularly when uh, Leo comes in with an entomb, so they were starting to fall back and give the camp up. The Svenskars, they took it. And, yeah, after level 10, definitely a bit more cautious. The red team. I mean, for good reason. Before that, you could literally just walk around, bully everybody into oblivion. Now you're not in uh, that much of an advantageous, advantageous situation anymore. Still really decent. I mean, they're still ahead by half a level. But they got to be more careful here now. Which they already are. So, good for them. Blaze is still up at the top, so the Quasa again is rocking it here, escorting another minion wave in. Down at the bottom, they're also doing their best to uh, make sure that they not only know exactly where, in this case, Mephisto and Diablo are positioned. The brothers, the evil brothers. But with the Nubarak now moving in from the top, they might even be able to get a proper flank going. And they're trying. Diablo gets hit a few times, but Bala and Uther are both at the top side camp on the top right. So there's no real threat here against them. It's the same play as before. Shrine is activating at the top this time, and both of the teams are trying for their Shaman camp, trying to ensure that they have some added lane pressure that they can use against the opponent. Still the skirmish is breaking out of the map as both teams are attempting to get into position. But there's an added level 13 talent that will give the red team a boost. And Vala has now gone into Gloom. Wants to make sure that she's not gonna get insta-killed by Mephisto once that he receives the nano boost of Ana. I mean, pretty smart play at the end of the day. You want to keep those gambit stacks alive and he really needs to be cautious. X-Ray now moving in once more. Here's the Entomb against him though and the Divine Shield from Uther. Arrow just flying past. They save Vala. They're sacrificing a couple of their ults for that. But yeah, definitely, definitely necessary and also warranted. So nice move made. 
Once again, the play for Leo, and he goes down. Leo goes down, and Vala just continues to stutter step her way forward. Maybe even to another kill. Certainly to another quest reward. They drop Mephisto. Marker is gone. Vala is at 100 stacks now, and things are looking better and better for the red team. Thus far, Vala honestly didn't even come close to dying. She was once low in HP earlier against Leoric, but it was pretty much from the get-go clear that at the end she would win that fight. And since nobody else followed up, she made it through it fairly easily. Now we're having her at 100 stacks, hasn't lost any attack speed yet. And they are walking towards the second objective, which should allow them to take this top fort out too. So structurally, they're moving ahead. And in stacks, she's also doing pretty darn good. As long as they're keeping Uza close to ensure that X-Ray doesn't get wrecked, they're going to be fine here. With half a level until 16, things are also looking better and better for the red team. So in game number one of the loser's bracket final, they are making some real nice plays currently. Down at the bottom of the map, still Maev is playing this out solo. Vala is now getting the fort at the top and the rest of the team has already started to rotate over the map. But yep, this one is going to get destroyed, no problem. And here's level 16. Vala has now Manticore with full attack speed bonus and with two additional uh, rewards for her level 1 quest. That is terrifying for Diablo. It is absolutely terrifying for every melee, essentially. And he's going to work in the damage. I mean, already we have Vala at 32,000, which is heaps and bounds ahead of everyone else. Gets a few more attacks in, takes Leoric down, so he's gone too. That's 34,000 in the books for her. And they are looking fantastic. They're looking great here. And Diablo is not going to like that at all. Manticore ready with that attack speed for Vala. Bleh. Yeah, good luck keeping him alive. Anna is going to have to pew pew her heart out in order to make that happen. And I'm not sure if that's going to be all that easy. So now since they have the two level advantage and also a talent lead, they're moving back down to the bottom of the map to try and break through the opponent's gate. Which are likely going to be able to do. And this is also going to be the lane where we're seeing the next objective spawn. So if you prep that and then you take the third Punisher, you can go for the keep directly. Vala with 111 right now. And yeah, Diablo is not going to like that front lining any longer. Turned from a bully into a weak kitten. I mean, maybe not quite. I'm still waiting for the moment when we see the Nano Boosted Mephisto really shining, because so far it hasn't really happened. The, the stars haven't aligned for them. The fight, have, the fight just hasn't come together in a way that he could really go for a big damage against Vala or anybody else. So it's a bit tricky for the blue team to currently activate that combo properly. They're going to try as best as they can in the next fight, because it's a bit of a do-or-die moment for them. They also wanted to wait for level 16, which they now hold, so still all good. But they have, they have to be super careful with this now, because if they lose the next fight, they're losing the first keep, and things can very easily snowball away from you once that happens. Game has slowed down a bit in regards to fights. Blue team was sitting tight and waiting for the next talent. Now they have it, so I assume that now we're going to get them in a more of an aggressive manner. They're going to be looking to do a bit more here. Or they're just waiting it out for the next try. But yeah, they gotta do something. Obviously, they're running out of time here. They're running out of time and space. They gotta do something with this. Already, we're having uh, everybody on the red team just trying to time the camp properly, which they're already looking for. So yes, the attack's at the top. Everybody is just like getting some vision, making sure that nobody uh, sneaks in and takes the uh, keep, or sorry, the, the, the camp without the knowledge. They time it right. And now they're getting closer and closer to level 20, and the Shrine isn't even announced. Bunker is used immediately upon Leoric, dropping his own ult. So once again, the exchanging cooldowns between the two teams here. Shrine gets announced, but I would honestly worry a little bit about the potential level 20. With 19 on the board now for the red team, there is a chance that they're getting more than that. This, on the other hand, with the Quasar not having his ult available any longer, is big. And there, X-Ray, X-Ray! Oh, six hit points! Six hit points! They killed Anna! Six hit points uh, and Vala survived. That's nuts. Vala actually survived this and apparently thinks she's unkillable because she moved straight back into the fight. Utha is having a hell of a job to do in order to keep her alive, but he managed to pull it off. Vala still sticking out the damage, getting those auto attacks moved in. 
42,000 for her now. But that last battle flipped things quite a bit. Now the blue team has control over the shrine. But they have a problem at the top lane because the shaman camp is still alive. Might now be taken out by the tower. And yes, it will. But in addition to that, we are also looking at a 3 versus 4 on the shrine. With Leo falling, soon coming back once again. And Leo gone means level 20. Two level ahead and level 20 for the space goofs. So pretty big. They have the far fly quiver for Vala. Things got even worse for Diablo. And you can see it right in front of you. Because he's getting absolutely wrecked here. Redemption. Utha is dodging on it. And the ghost. They need to keep Vala alive. And they can. They kept her alive. She's at 142 stacks. But they cannot win the objective. The Punisher this time goes over to the Svenskars. They are trying to bring this game back. And it's going to be difficult. They might be able to save themselves until they have their own level 20 and then uh, bring this back somehow. But yeah, Vala is just pew pewing this with Farfly Quiver. Trying to go for Leoric, but misses out on the stacks and the movement speed that comes with it, so has to retreat. But, yeah, okay, they were waiting and hoping that they get an Uther stun through. But not quite. Arcane Punisher is going, slowly getting defeated. Vala is looking for a few more attacks. Okay, gets stunned into the Entomb Wall. Nice. Arrows coming out. Divine Shield, more heals. Yes, there it is. Divine Shield is ready. And Vala stutter stepping her way to more damage, more quest rewards. Chia might fall. Dodges, ah, but gets Hanzo'd. And then Hanzo gets a second later stunned out, but they're all dropping a bit low. And X-Ray in particular might still be able to throw some auto attacks their way, but he is dropping low in mana, and that makes them retreat. He has unlocked the third quest reward of his level 1 talent, on the other hand. By the way, Makep not done with his level 1 quest yet on Mephisto. He's still two stacks away from it, as Vala is now dropping 60,000 damage in total. And with level 20 talents on both sides, that means that the blue team now has access to Buried Alive. So that's obviously a big one to lock in for yourself and could be game deciding. If he gets a good Entomb through, that might be all that they need in order to turn the game around. Even with Hellgate, ah, it was a nice idea. Hellgate and the ult from Mephisto as Diablo tried to make the engage happen, but it just didn't work. <laughs> and X-Ray is definitely having some fun. He only locked in... A f yeah, well, there's the Entomb. And it's still going to be fine. A bit of a scare, and that's all there's to it. <laughs> but I still like it. <laughs> oh, the Leo just went in and was like, no, you don't. He died five times so far. Activated his trade. My apologies. Funnily enough, Vala is the only one that hasn't died yet. The one that you want to kill the most has not died even once. And now she's just padding her stacks. I mean, these order attacks, look how quickly Diablo loses hit points despite the heals that he receives. Vala just turns and takes him down. No chance. Lots of damage being done now, at least to the front line. So Mephisto with the nano boost is still able to do a lot of work here. But Vala still targeting Leoric. And he's also just dropping. Another kill for the auto attacker. Even with Blaze falling, that's still a W for the space goofs. And Vala is currently, I mean, she's now padding her damage to 77,000. She just picked up 12,000 damage in that last fight. That's kind of bonkers. That's more damage that Uther has in the entire game. She basically picked up as much damage as both of the supports have together. In just the last fight. And obviously is now also making her way to the next quest reward to add even more damage to the equation. 51,000 for Hanzo and Mephisto on 39,000. They just can't keep up. And the blue team hasn't taken a single fort out yet. Vala, in the meantime, needs only 8 more hits before she unlocks the next damage tier of her level 1. So, yeah. Even more percent damage. It's, again, it's a tough game for Diablo. Specifically for him. With Manticore and the attack speed, it's just brutal. So, they can just pew pew this one out. Shrine is activating at the top, and the big problem that now exists for the blue team, no matter where the shrine spawns, is that they don't have a fountain nearby. And the red team still has a fountain on every single lane. None of their forts have been destroyed. All of the forts are still in play, and that's the big problem that they're facing here right now. So yes, the other attacks are being woven in. Ana is already dead. That's a disaster once that your support is gone. 
Bala gets the additional quest reward. Uther is gone, but he has redemption, so he'll be back. Mephisto won't be, <laughs> at least not anytime soon. He's down for a minute. They're still trying to make a play for Vala, and maybe this time they get the chance. Diablo really wants her, and he still doesn't get her. <laughs> the heals are coming out, and X-Ray survives through all of it. It's ridiculous. Diablo, and no, even here, it's Uther that heals her, and it's a five-man team wipe. Nuts. Absolutely nuts. So, as is, we now have Vala on 90,000 damage. Absolutely crushing this. Dayquaza is starting to move down to the bot lane with the remaining team. Mayev is dead. But, yep, off we go. With this, we're having the move towards the core, and I don't think they are going to be able to stop them. They might be able to slow them a little bit down with Leoric, but this is going to be insane amounts of damage. Vala is just melting things away here. Heroes are spawning one after another, but the core is slowly falling. Ana very much alone. They're already going in with one stun after another. Anubura coming in with a rewind. Ana, she comes and she goes immediately. 18 kills to 8. Nearly a full quest reward for Vala. And well, guys, this is game. This is going to be... Well, no, it isn't. <laughs> Mephisto is actually taking the entire team apart. Has his mimic and drops them all. What? 24% remaining on the core as they came in and Mephisto just said, all right, time to play. <laughs> Mephisto just said, okay guys, I've been holding back, but I'm actually ready. We can start this now. So as the game was about to end, Mephisto dropped three of them in a moment. Just in a second. <laughs> Absolutely crushing them. <laughs> oh, he came, he saw, and he conquered. <laughs> 30 stacks and the blue team not giving up. Blue team not giving up whatsoever. Down to the bottom of the map. The attacks are coming. Chia is getting ready for all of this. To push the lane out a bit with the camp. He timed it so that the camp is moving in just as the top side. They're trying to execute a push for Fort and potentially keep. So yes, this is going to push straight up for the core with catapults in tow. But the blue team is obviously going to try to push this now as hard as they can. Yeah, they're going to go deep for this. Nice Punisher also to execute a death push. They got the Frozen Punisher. You can do a lot with that. And, yeah, how far can they go with this? Vala lost one of her Gambits. One Gambit stack is now removed. Yeah, and they're moving back. They're not risking anything. They have 24% on their core. They need to move back or the Catapults are going to wreck this. We're already 22 minutes into the game. This is... Uh, okay. In the middle, they only can do a little bit. Keep at the top. Vala's taking care of it. Yep. X-Ray Kate takes her down, baits it into the middle. And the Punisher is about to be eliminated. So, yeah. It's not going to take the keep on, but the team fight down here, that's a different story. Cocoon is already out. Arrow misses everything. Doesn't connect with the single hero. Now they got Vala in the action again. Stun after stun. There's the Entomb, but they should be fine. Leo is alone, not able to take all of them out here. Instead, he might be in trouble. Gets super quickly chunked down. And they're still chasing them. They want the kill. And yep, it's Winion time. And the Winions take it. GG. Well played. Winions won. Svenska Zero. <laughs> GG. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Well, here we are. Game number two. Space Winions against the Svenskas. So in Infernal Shrines at the end, it was actually <laughs> the catapults that ended the game. The blue team realized what was happening, but, but they were a bit too late in moving back. I think initially they really had hopes that they could move through the top lane and do their thing there. But unfortunately for them, it wasn't really the case. So as is, we now have the Svenskas with first pick, first ban. As we're going into game number two. And let's see if the red team has a chance to bring this one back. It's actually a very smart map choice too. Because the minions cannot win on Towers of Doom. So it's actually interesting. The only 
only problem with that theory is that the map was chosen by the red team. But I could have totally accepted the blue team going for the map choice, just simply saying, you know what, the minions are actually scarier than the team itself, so let's go into towers, then we only have to deal with one. So, yeah. Hogger gets banned. Again, only one draft rule in this entire tournament. A hero cannot be played again in the same series. So every hero can only appear in a match one time. There's no pre-bans, not in the qualifiers, not in the playoffs, not anywhere else. We have a bit of a twist coming in towards the playoffs for you that we're going to reveal after the qualifiers are over. Already had a couple of guesses in YouTube comments and on Twitch of people, they were thinking, okay, what could it be? And again, to immediately stop that, no, it's not reverse drafting. Reverse drafting is one of the most boring things that you can possibly imagine. It's fun for like two maps, maybe three and then it's just the same heroes over and over and over and over and over again. So yeah, it's getting insanely boring super quickly. So yeah, no reverse drafts, but we have a bit of a twist. We have a bit of an interesting adjustment for the playoffs for you, which are not going to put the players out too much. It's still going to be pretty epic, and I really think you're going to like it. So uh, yeah, we're going to reveal that after the qualifiers are over. For now, only rule is you can only play a hero once within a series. Brightwing gets banned, and after Lucio got the boot, so did Sylvanas. Still a bit of a sacrilege that Sylvanas gets banned in the Banshee Cup. That's kind of crazy. Now we have Dehaka, who gets very quickly locked in by Max Passion. I'm sure that Dequaza would have loved to play this one as well, now that Blaze is not an option anymore. Yeah, so Dehaka on the side lane, and off goes the double pick. With Towers of Doom, things obviously change a little bit. You can still go for a few other globals. False that is up, you can go for some Moro. You have quite a few options. But they are going for already an aggressive opening with Rega and more importantly Tyrael. So now either Sanctification or Judgment. So one of the two. And that could get wild. I love that we are having more Judgment ever since Nick popularized the build. The more aggressive Tyrael build. Sometimes as a side laner, sometimes as a main tank. Not saying we're going to get it here. But I really like that now when we see Ethereal, we actually have to guess a little bit what they're going to do with it. If we're going to get a judgment-oriented build, or if it's just going to be a typical sanctification play. Genji and Johanna might result in Anduin being banned out. And... yeah. If you are comfortable going up against Genji, Lightbomb, and Gage, and well, this answers it quickly, they're not. They are just making sure that this combo is not going to make it into the second map. I mean, this is match point, obviously. If the uh, Space Minions are now claiming victory here, they would move on to the Grand Final to face off against the Raiders. So the Raiders are already waiting in the Grand Final. If the Svenskars are turning it around, then it is a rematch. And yeah, time will tell. I mean, right now, we got our final ban and it's Urel. So not together with Diablo here. What could he still pick on the side lane? What do you think is the most likely that we're going to get from uh, Dequaza in that context? I mean, Leo was already played, Blaze, Hogar's banned, so is Ural. They're really targeting him a little bit, or at least they're trying to, aren't they? Yeah, good luck banning out Dequaza. <laughs> it's usually not a thing. We get Zarya! Damn, even without Ixia, we're getting a Zarya today. And we have Yaza as the damage dealer. Okay, that very quickly shifted things. And so now we have the heal shield plus a Zarya shield, Cassia in. This is a pretty strong four, man, that can start to crush you. I would love for the Aquaza now all of a sudden bust out some Muro or Vikings, just some stuff that we haven't seen from him all that often in the past. That would be kind of fun. But yeah, there's a lot of shields now. I mean, Rega can also contribute one, of course, too. Malfurion and Chromate round out the draft for the blue team and our final pick for the Space Minions on Towers of Doom. What are they going to get? What is Quasar going to play? The foreman is clear. We already know what they're going to use to try and take down the bot lane. Specifically, the bot lane is something that they're going to target. And they go for the Vikings. I love it. They Quasar with the Vikings. Towers of Doom. And this one just got awesome. <laughs> Let's go. 
Game number two on the left side, the Svenskas. We have Banana Age on Chromie, Macke on Malfurion. Gia is playing Genji for the blue team. We have Skog on Johanna and Max Passion is playing Dehaka. On the right side of the map, a play Rocky Interior for the Space Goofs. We have X-Ray on Rega, Dequaza on the Vikings, Yasu on Zarya. And Chia is playing Cassia in the second game of the Best of Three series. All right, and seems like we're finally ready and good to go. So, <laughs> essentially, it seems like initially Gia went to the bathroom, then Gia came back from the bathroom, but we had already some ping problems that evolved on the side of the space goofs, and they needed a break as well. So we've actually been sitting here for a while, and now finally we can start to kick things off. It's awesome to have the Vikings in the game, by the way, so I'm really looking forward to that. Once that they drafted Zarya, that became more of an option, but I, yeah, I really, really like that we're getting Vikings action plus Zarya, and it's just shields galore for the Space Goofs. So they have high hopes that this can guarantee them a 2-0 victory over the Spenskars. And, well, we want to figure out together if this is going to be the case or not. Attacks are already coming, one hit after another. And let's see how far they can go with this. Already, yeah, they go for Eric. No, no, Chromie. <laughs> it's the same size. Chromie is the same size. I didn't do it on purpose. I really didn't. I thought it was Eric. <laughs> I just saw something small running away and I was just like, yeah, that has to be Eric, but no, it's Gnomi. <laughs> oh, too damn good. That's actually a match made in heaven. Chromie and Eric, that would be a pretty cute couple, I think. They have the same height and you can just zoom in, you know, if you take the wedding pictures, you just zoom in, make them look a little bit taller than they actually are. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Uh, you need a microscope for that relationship. So, anyways, uh, one kill already. Chromie got eliminated. And, yeah, obviously, obviously, if Eric would ever go for Chromie, he would be the one settling in that relationship. Every relationship has a Reacher and a Settler, and we all know who would be what when it comes to that pairing of the two of them here. So that's a bit of a given. I mean, duh, didn't think I would have to need to point this out, but anyways. So... We have, for now, the four men at the bottom of the map as already expected, starting to try and push things a little bit. If you have such a strong four man with an insane amount of sustain and good damage from Zarya when she goes brrrr, and also uh, Cassia dishing it out, then you want to be the one breaking through those walls quickly, invading the opponent's camp as they're already attempting to do. Genji is thinking about doing something about it, but they're also falling behind an experience, which now has an early level four talent in the hands of the space goofs. Baylor goes down, sacrificed for a good course, and oof, Zarya survives, but damn, that was calculated, to say the least. So, uh, able to get away, but at the same time, we're now looking at the plate of the whale for Cassia, and Zarya has gone for I am the strongest. There's no garage in this game, so they didn't have to go for the speed barrier. Don't have to accelerate anybody on the team. And <laughs> Dequaza is having some fun against Gia. Just running circles around Genji on this one. So yeah, good for him. Triple order phases up. And this is where we're gonna get the first little party. It's obviously annoying when you're on this map and you go up against the Vikings. They can just interrupt you. They can delay things. If you're not immediately ready to grab an altar, the Vikings might sneak in, might sneak past you and take it for themselves. So it is dicey. But at the bottom of the map, a bit of body blocking going on as they're trying for Malfurion. And Marke, Marke gets away. Good for him. Marke gets out, but I still think they're gonna lose the third shrine. Actually, they might be able to grab it. Vikings are still on the lanes. Now it becomes a question of how long can the red team stall this one out. Or if they can get a kill. But Rega is the one that falls, apparently. They get the counter kill on Genji, on the other hand. But their, some of their sustain now is gone. They still have a bunch of shields, which is obviously neat. Vikings are also still controlling the side lanes. So more experience kicking in for the space groups, allowing them to go to an early level 7. And nearly taking the Anker down. Yeah, players move away as Chromie is dishing out more pain. Cassia has fallen. And they still get the channel. No, they didn't. He get interrupted. Interrupted by Jojo moving in from the top. He was so close. What was that? 
0.1 seconds that they were away from a successful channel and now Make is able to grab it for the blue team. Good for them. That looked like they would lose out on it. But they're able to take it. So all good in the hood. Now we have the next camp about to be taken. Swift Retribution is in. We're getting the Grounded Totem. Surge of Light and the Explosive Barrier for Zarya. Okay. It's definitely going to be a bit of a party here. We now have Temporal Loop in the house. Two kills to two. Blue team has actually taken a small lead in experience for a second, but the attack's still coming here. Another attack moving through with Chromie, barreling away with one Dragon's Breath after another. Pumpkin still being guarded. Banana Age. This time, this time they swapped it again. Maka now on the support. Banana Age on damage. Is going to get the assists here. But they're getting pressured back. Yeah, that foreman is still powerful and it forces the Arca to come down to make it a 5 versus 4. Connects the drag against Tyriel. Play should still be able to move out and the Vikings are back to pushing the lanes in the mid and the top lane. It's gonna be a feisty one. Pew! <laughs> uh, trying to take the Arca down one pebble at a time. Yep, Dequaza. Okay, so... Still fairly even right now on uh, pretty much every metric. Kills are the same, levels are the same, points in the core nearly identical with a single altar popping up at the bottom of the map. Vikings back to their usual shenanigans as everybody is slowly starting to get into position over here. Then early level 10 would be fantastic for the blue team though. If they can grab that, then uh, getting the initial start into the fight with rogue abilities could decide the altar completely. We're not quite there yet though, and Vikings plus the Haka are still working on that extra XP. And it's the Haka that gets it first. So Blessed Shield is now out. We immediately have the Space Goofs falling back a little bit, just trying to buy enough time for the Vikings to get the rest of the experience. And there it is. So now both of the teams are on level 10. Banana H gets interrupted. Nice, that was clutch though. Sanctification for Terrier, they're not going full YOLO. Bless Shield is out. Dehaka looking for the Tong. Sanctification comes in. Nice move by Terrier, countering the play immediately. But the drag on Rhaegar still connects. Isolation as well, and he goes down. Rhaegar gets wrecked. The support is gone, and so is Cassia. Genji with two kills, both of them beautifully teed up by Dehaka. Max Passion with some nice connects here. Well done. Now we even have uh, Chromie's level 13 in. And with the altar shots fired, it's now 28 to 36 points on the core. Yeah, the comp doesn't work exactly as intended for the red team yet. I mean, obviously from the get-go, the whole idea here was to ensure that they are moving in with a strong foreman, and let the Vikings get the experience and then just yeah, control the flow of the game, get the foreman pushing, Vikings accelerate the experience gains and they're slowly taking control of the map, particularly camps and bell towers. But the red team is fighting back very nicely against them. Even stealing the camp away over here, getting the additional kills, and just generally being highly unimpressed with the composition uh, that is being played against them. So they're looking great here. They're looking absolutely powerful, full-on control too for them. If they can keep it up like this, then hey, fantastic. We go to game number three and we get a deciding map. But I don't want to jump ahead too much because this could still be turned around any second. It's Towers of Doom after all, and it's not like the blue team has an insane lead or something. They are ahead, clearly, but it's not completely bonkers what we're looking at here. They still have to, uh, yeah, they still have to go a long way in order to make this work. And the foreman hasn't really given up yet. They don't have a lot of CCs though. This is probably their biggest problem. They are essentially without any stuns. They have pretty much nothing really. On level 16, the Vikings are gonna contribute with uh, Olaf's talent, with the large and in charge. We have also the totem, so once you get the grounded totem, you can play around with that a little bit. But if you think about just hard CC, there's very little that we're seeing from the red team. And then on the other side, you have a root from Alfuri, and you have a blessed shield, you have the slows from Jojo, you have the tongue from the Haka. There's a lot there. And talking the Haka, he's already coming back in. Trying for Cassie, uh, for Zarya. Yeah, Cassie has there too. Rega, the first one to go down. They are following it up with Zarya and they're just slicing and dicing through the team. 
easy peasy blue team is going to their opponents like hot butter through cheese as they are dropping four heroes without even trying absolutely wrecking them and allowing for chromie to get the channel so awesome stuff well done but now we have nine kills so they're pretty heavily ahead of two in kills and experience they're getting control at the bottom of the map they've already taken the advantage on uh, the pure core damage with 24 to 36 but yeah with this one falling we have the haka up at the top doing his thing here as well max passion obviously just pushing this one out and yeah Good luck coming back into this. They're two levels behind. They don't have level uh, 16 yet, the blue team, but they're getting close. And the red team is nowhere near that. They're really struggling to keep up in experience. Can have a bit of an idea on the experience distribution over here. But Hero's experience alone, just look at that massive gap. That's a 5,500 gap between the two teams. That's only Hero experience. Even in the minion experience, they're behind. With Vikings on the map, and even with that, we have a uh, lack in uh, XP for on minions for the red team, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. So, yeah, not looking good. Not looking good at all. They're pushing back in. At least the pumpkin's connected. Eric goes down. Sanctification already on the ground here as they're continuing the fights. Everybody is getting pushed back. We now have 16 on the board. That gives us the extra talent, and they're looking for kills. They want some additional kills, and they are about to get some. Nice Ancestral, though. Tranquility also coming out just in time to save the day. But, well, this is by no means over yet. As long as the red team cannot get their, their bell tower back, they're still in an awkward position. And obviously they know it too. So the altars, they're spawning one at a time. Actually, in this case, it's two. But how to bring this back if you don't even have level 16 talents? They might get one just because the position is always annoying to fight for. And they have the Vikings, so they can just throw some bodies at the problem and deal with it, which is essentially what they're doing right now. But they are still going for bad trades. And Zarya gets killed too. So Zarya is gone, dies at the bottom of the map. And yeah, Skork is already B stepping. Spray game is on point. Goes for the B step. 10 kills to 2. Obviously, they are super confident right now, and they really should be. 8 kills ahead against this combo. I mean, damn, they have every reason to be confident. The only possible way where I can see the game shift a little bit is after level 16 when they have Olaf stun, large and in charge, and when they have the ground the totem that they maybe can use that CC to make some plays. But the way this is going, I highly doubt it. Now it's again Cassia that falls. Everybody else is just running away, trying to get out. Pumpkins, uh, it's 19 points on the core against 33. And the points on the core are not really the problem, but they're losing so much. Zarya gets attacked again, tries to go brrrr. By now we have the Earth Grasp Totem and we got the Larger in charge, but Zarya has died again. She's kind of getting used to it at this point. Died three times, Cassia has fallen four times, the Vikings are struggling, the mid lane bell tower is nearly taken, so that's another problem that they currently have. And just all in all, a disastrous spot for the red team to be in. This seems like we're going the distance. Unless the blue team is now going for full-on brain fart, they should be more than fine here. I mean, they're dominating every aspect of the game. Talents are now even, but we have a triple altar phase. And this triple altar phase could nearly end the game. If you get all your altars and the boss is definitely over. I mean, even two altars in the boss would already get you nearly there. So they're stealing the camp away, or at least they're trying. They're not quite sure yet what they want. Here comes at least Sanctification and Ancestral. They used Sanct and Ancestral for this. Shots are being fired. Vikings are trying to get at least some of it. But the battle continues and the blue team takes the camp. Blue team indeed took the camp. Bell Tower is at least regained, but yeah, that is just bonkers. 13 points on the core, and with the channel of Mark at the bottom, if he gets it, then it's going to be single digits on the core for them. But at least the kill here, can they? Can they kill her? Jojo? Oh, come on. Come on. Really? She gets out? Okay, at this point I start feeling sorry for them. <laughs> Do you have no mercy? Can't you show at least a little bit of pity? How did Jojo make it out here? At least give them a pity kill. Nope, apparently that's not the thing. Malfurion gets attacked. 
Cassia is gone, they don't even get a pity kill. Play, again, <laughs> they all are just B-stepping. No, they know exactly what's happening, they know it's over. They're just like, okay, this is just GG. Tyrael goes down, Yaz is eliminated, boss is up, Alta is up. They can go boss, they can go Alta, and that will end the game. It honestly feels a little bit bad, but they never really found into the game, did they now? They never really had a moment where it felt like they were able to make a proper play here to get the momentum that they need in order to make this work. So, yeah, they get destroyed over here. And, I mean, kudos. Kudos to the Svenskars. They are able to pull it off. The Space Goofs, they accept their fate. That's game, and we are going to game number three. We're going to the final map of this best of three series in the loser's bracket final. GG, and well played. Game number three. So, the Space Winions against the Svenskars. I mean, granted, this time it wasn't any problems with Winions that decided the map, but honestly, to be fair, I'm just too lazy to change the overlay for this one. <laughs> That's all that it is. The renaming made sense after the first map right now. It's just pure laziness of yours truly. Uh, and since it is the third map, you know, who cares? So, we're going the distance. The winner is moving up to the grand final and faces off against the Raiders. The loser takes third place in the tournament and all the points for the leaderboard that comes with it. Now that we're heading into Tomb, teams have to step it up a little bit. The, the, the draft on the last map just never really came together for the red team. The whole idea with the four-man and Vikings is always that the Vikings are soaking the lanes and then the four-man is wreaking havoc and they kind of lost both. The Vikings lost against the Haka, and the four men lost against their four men. So it just didn't do anything. They lost control of the game very early on, and the blue team just perfectly executed it and brought it over the distance. So yeah, well executed, a well-deserved victory, and it brings us now to the all-deciding series. But now that we're heading into Tomb, we have the Haka. Uh, unavailable because he's been played already, but we have Hogger banned, so yeah, that's another hero that has an H in the name. The Fleabag. The newest addition to the Storm. The newest addition. In addition to that, we get Sylvanas banned out. Sylvanas, Hogger, and Lucio. Alright. I want to see some Kerrigan action on this map. I mean, really give me some some spicy stuff. Drop an Azebo into the mix for good measure, push it into the late game, something along those lines. Just, yeah, let's make that thing work. Now, we already get our final ban, at least for the initial phase. Anything that they are particularly afraid of or that they want to get rid of here. Seems, I mean, both of the teams, honestly, like, pretty drawing out those bans and picks. So, yeah, they get rid of Ural. All right. Ural gets banned out. And it's time for our first pick on Tomb. When it comes to frontline picks, we could also still see a bit of Garrosh action. I wouldn't really mind that. I think Murden. Murden hasn't been played in the series either, right? So a bit of a Stormbolt setup that he can use. Just jump around with a Dwarf a little bit. Yeah, so Murden should still be up as well. There's still plenty to go for. And they started things with Stukov. I mean, this is already Screaming Varian. Every time you see Stukov as a first pick... I mean, Stukov is a first pick worthy hero in a lot of scenarios, particularly, of course, here, but we had this in the past. So it's not necessarily that you see Stukov and you're immediately thinking Varian, but obviously the idea is always that you are starting with a stun and then uh, Stukov's lurking arm. So you could use that with Murden, you could use that with Varian. Murden picked away. Chances that Varian are going to be taken here, pretty big. If you want to play Jaina, for example, or you want to maybe even play Gul'dan, have all of that AoE that comes with either of the mages, and then some added uh, CC slows and horrify, you can definitely do that here. Anduin, though, destroys some of that. I mean, Anduin is really the perfect counter to any of these lockdown sniper combos if he's quick enough with his trade. But they go Garrosh, so a bit different. And Medivh, okay. Yeah, throwing Medivh into the mix is always switching things up quite significantly. It's also a bit of a risk if Medivh dies, doesn't complete his baseline, then he loses some of his usefulness. And it's always about how well your opponent controls portals, how well you do. Side laner, 
might now become an option or a topic for the blue team because essentially they're going to see if they can control the portals with something. Heroes that usually come to mind are Stukov, Malfuria, and ETC. Anything that can provide a stun and stun heroes out or lock them down that try to move through a portal. But I like that we have a bit more Medivh now as well. He's actually been missing for a little bit. Tracer also gets banned out as the final one after Greymane. And, well, that leads us straight into uh, the next double pick for the blue team. And they kind of know what's coming now. So, are they trying to uh, counteract Medivhia in some way, shape, or form? Could have also seen, like, Stitches go for a good old kidnap comp. Hook, Gorge, Portal provided, and then you just run away with the, with the target. Kidnap comps were always kind of funny. But we get Chen for Max Passion. That had to happen eventually. <laughs> it was just a matter of time. And we get a Junker at 4 Banana Age. So, what does it give us as the uh, Zul, roaming Zul and Gul'dan? We get our Mage and we get Zul. Gia therefore, final pick for game number 3. And again, this is the final one. The winner is going to move on to the grand final. Loser takes third place. Gia's final pick for the blue team as we are about to head into Tomb of the Spider Queen. And let's see what they're going to do here. I mean, a bit more damage would definitely be nice for them. So, uh, Gia and his choice. But I like Zul also for the wave clear at the bot lane. And they go for Falstad. They got Falstad. They got some gust action. They can maybe keep them away from some of the portals. And with that, we're set. Game number three, Tomb of the Spider Queen. Let's go. Game number three, the final map in the series. Who's going to move on to face off against the Raiders? On the left, in blue, we got the Svenskars with Mucke on Anduin, Banana H on Junkrat, Skook is playing Murden. We got Max Passion on Chen, which is pretty much his alter ego at this point, and Gia on Falstad. To the right side of the map, their opponents with Dequaza on Zul, the Space Goofs with X-Ray on Stukov, Yasu is playing Gul'dan, going for for stacks with level 1 runes affliction later after the echo corruption now we got play on garage for the front line and probably most importantly here Chiaseka is playing Medivh so that's going to tell us a lot about how the game goes depending on how he how successful he is with not only the stacks but just the overall performance around portals around shields that he has to throw out so should be in for a treat here we had two very different games so far and Medivh as a pick alone is already making this spicy. Then you got Fat Illidan, Chen on the blue team side, and Zul as a damage dealer against minions that can of course do an enormous amount of work, even just as a rotating tool. We've seen that in the days of HGC tons of times also on let's say Sky Temple when he was just roaming from one lane to another whereas everyone else was going for the objective. So he can provide a lot. Not even speaking of the CC that he contributes as well. But the first attack is also against him. So Zul gets for a moment caught, but Garrosh is ready. Portals were also starting to come out here. So yeah, we're off to the races. And at least for now, as the teams are starting to gather up a couple of gems, the camps are popping up and this is where both of the teams start to get fairly interested in what they can lock down in regards to that. With a good timing, for example, you get a camp, you get a decent timing on it. You might be able to take a tower down off the mid lane wall both of them doing that right now as we speak. We still got some portals and Dequaza is actually being saved in this instance. But they're turning in on Falstead and that's a kill. The birdie is down, more chicken. And yeah, I'm getting hungry again. Absolutely, so he's dead and gone. First blood for the red team. Off to a good start here, they're gonna like that. How much further can they go with this? Banana Age also dropping a bit lower as Gul'dan is taking the opportunity over here to get some stacks together on his level 1 and that damage over time with all of the fell that he can muster is doing some work. So yeah, good for them. Now level 4 talents are of course kicking in. We get some additional portal talents with the Raven Familiar. And Medivh is on 11 stacks now. Nothing too insane yet, but again, working on this, trying to ensure that he is going to get that completed before he dies and doesn't want to be fully reset on it. So, can he do that? Time will tell, but at least for now, he's doing good work. Sitting at 14 right now at the two and a half minute mark, so yeah, it's going to be solid. Blue team is obviously going to try to murder him if they get a chance here. 
Chen is already at the bottom of the map doing his thing over here. And is trying to get Siege Giant camp together with Maka. Zul slowly making his move over, but they're already too late if they're trying to indoor. Well, actually, they're not. Not quite too late. With the portal, they can rotate quickly, and they do exactly that. So here's the invasion, and they're going to get their camp. It seems like they do, because Falstad might fly down, but Gul'dan is also on the way. It's a full-on slaughter here, and Falstad is in the mix. Zul is the first one to die. Max Panda is about to go down too, and the blue team grabs it. Blue team gets not only their gems back, but they're also taking the camp. Good for them. Everybody committing, on the other hand. So, yeah, two kills to one. We got 25 stacks now for Medivh. I think he... Uh, Medivh, depending on the cooldowns, there's obviously the possibility that they at some point also made the call because he simply didn't have abilities to throw out any longer and he doesn't want to die. But now they're attempting to isolate him and they do a pretty good job on it. They miss out on the kill, though. If they get that kill, yeah, it hurts. It would have hurt a lot. But thankfully for them, it didn't go that far, so they're still good here. Falstad at the top, by the way, has been attacked pretty heavily by Dequaza, and Gia is a little bit low, so he needs to be super careful here. Bottom of the map, the fight continues too, as they're making moves for Garrosh, but he's not the only one falling low. Muradin is also running out of hit points. Everybody retreating, seven kicking in, and in addition to that, we're now looking at 31 stacks for Medivh, so he is really getting there. Gul'dan also attacked and always that follow up from Junkrat and this time it's too much they can't handle it Gul'dan goes down that's the second kill for the blue team well played so they're able to get their kills together as well it's not only the red team that is making some moves here Medivh getting closer and closer to completing his quest is sitting at 33 now <laughs> this is the time when you have to be the most careful I mean, you really have to, because if you mess this up now, you will never forgive yourself. 33 stacks for him, so he can try and go for another interrupt here, maybe not straight in front of Murden, who's going to quickly lock you down. It's like kind of horrible when you're trying to say Murden and you're thinking about Malfurion for some point at the same time, and, you say, and you're thinking about like Murden. And nothing really comes out, but yeah, so Murden, Malfurion, only one of them is actually in the game, and you shouldn't drop in front of either one of them, because both have some CC that they can throw on Birdman, and that could spell out the end of Medivh. So if you had 34 stacks, probably let that slide. But, either way, with the blue Web Weavers now confirmed, it is indeed the Svenskas that are getting the first set of Web Weavers. The spiders are already on the way. Medivh is sitting at 34 stacks, by the way, and still not quite done, but he's getting closer. And of course, in addition to that, we're also looking uh, for level 10 abilities. And yeah, is there gonna be a gap? Is maybe the blue team able to sync that up with their push? It doesn't really look too likely. If they get a kill, that would help them. But if anything, it might be the opponent that gets one. And indeed, there it is. So, Falstead is gone. And that is, of course, glorious. That defense just got so much easier. They're going to get the early level 10 very likely with it if they go for the waves now, which they do. They can push them back. Falstead isn't here. So, this is exactly what you want. An objective for the opponent that does pretty much nothing. Awesome. They're going to love that. But can they get more? 37 stacks for Medivh. He's really making it... Uh, I mean, the suspense is honestly killing me. <laughs> he's really... He's really making this a thing. I thought that by now he would just line up, you know, one good attack and then be done with it. But no, he's just keeping us guessing if he's going to be able to complete it properly or not. Uh, I don't think you want to risk anything here either. So, yeah. 38 stacks. 19 for Gul'dan. Turn in possibility also for the red team. Obviously, they hold the amount of gems that they need for this. Yeah, another hit. Banana, and he dies. Not a single stack acquired for Medivh in the process. <laughs> so they get their turn in, and they get their kill. Four kills to two now. And the red web weavers, they're coming in. Red web weavers are on the move. And they're already pressuring the middle and take the wall down. The camp timing was perfect. 39 stacks for Medivh. One more hit, baby. One more hit is all that he needs. 
quest complete. Time to feed. Oh yeah, let's go. So, there it is. Quest completed for Medivh. He's gonna be happy about that. And the timing is exceptional. The Web Weavers are touching ground. The camp is still there. And now they can start to make their move for a kill. Maybe for Mirrodin here. Light Bomb Barrel. <laughs> a Barrel Light Bomb. I haven't seen that too many times. Max Passion is jumping in again, but he might regret that. That fort is definitely going to get crushed. And now that they're jumping through the portal, they were hoping to get a kill on top of it. Which hasn't worked, but one fort. Hey, first objective, one fort. That's totally fine. That's absolutely Gucci. If you can get a bit more than that, even better, but one objective, one fort, at least if it's the first one, is good to go. Fallstead is in trouble and he knows it, and well, he's dead. <laughs> he was thinking about flying away, and even that is not a thing, so yeah. Second fort is getting attacked and loses some hit points. I don't think they can destroy the entire thing unless they are picking up kill number two, but this is still pretty solid. Reptire, and it's just not enough. Even moving through the portal just to ensure that they're saving not only the gems, but also Gul'dan's life. And he's already back. He still has Horrify, by the way. So he could use that, should use that, and has, which helps them a bit here. Yeah, 32 gems for Garrosh. They're going for Scoop, and Muradin gets murdered. And so does Jen. Does he? Jen? Jen? Team, please? Jen? Yeah, she survives. <laughs> Good for him. Chen survives. They take the fort out, though. That's two forts destroyed now. And I would still call worse here. X-Ray might fall, but again, uh, it's fine. It's totally fine. Six kills to three. You're still looking good. Still doing your thing. But yeah, some crazy battles down there. And I want to see it raging on for an eternity. Level 13 talents. A bit early for them. Gul'dan on 25,000 now. 32 stacks also for his level 1. That's pretty good. If you get your quest completed by the time that 16 kicks in and you're going for Runa's Affliction, that's always a dream. That's always awesome. But yep, there's the next keg, the next barrel. They go for Dequaza once more. Try and take him down. Ah, oh, there's the jump. Uh, but he cannot connect that light bomb to save his life. Talking about saving lives. Dequaza is saving his as he runs away. And they have the choke point, and Gul'dan is saying thank you very much. And is just lining them up for some Echo Corruption stacks and nearly completing his quest. So yeah, they're doing work. And Dequaza is moving in too. They're still chasing them. They still think that they can take this, and why not? They're completing Gul'dan's quest, they're taking Chen down, they're taking Junkrat down, and gems are lost all over the place. And for some reason, okay, that's a pity move. They left um, Anduin alive because they're just so sorry for him. I mean, Anduin's life is hard enough. He uh, is anxiety riddled, he's crying all the time, he's always been a little bit of a pussy. And in this case, yeah, they're just coming in and they're just letting him live, they have to. So, yeah. Stugov didn't want to be a dick here or anything, but yeah, it would have been if he just, you know, took him down. So instead, it's just like, you know what, dude, like, just live. It's fine. It's okay. So down at the bottom of the map, we now have Siege Giants in. Webweavers are now again coming. Initially, it was the blue team that was hoping that they could complete the entire thing, and that didn't really work out for them. So uh, the space goofs, they took control. And they are now in the driver's seat. I mean, it's a two-level gap. They nearly have level 16. They got the Web Weavers too. We now have the push through the middle for the first keep of the game. The top side fort should be destroyed by the Web Weavers alone. Rip tire to try and take the minion waves out. But yeah, it is blasting. There's the 16 talents. Fallset is defending the bottom of the map. Stukov with a big shove. Get out of here. Pushing his targets out. Topside Ford has indeed fallen. Two levels ahead still. They want the keep and they might just get it. They might get more than that. If they can pick kills up, that would be the dream. Murder in particular. 25 gems. If you can take them out, even better. So they are making the moves. Half the HP of the keep are already gone. And they might get the entire thing. They should get the entire thing. Gul'dan should take aim on it. But yep, it's gonna fall. So big, big leads made by the Space Goofs. They want to go to the grand final. And they're making all the right plays now. The rotation towards the top to safeguard the top side keep. Buys a bit more time at the bottom of the map. Might just take the camp and push through the middle once more. But the next issue is, of course, that Medivh is cheating as usual. And just flying 
giving them vision. He knows exactly what's happening, where everybody is positioned, so they can go for the safe plays here. And can potentially also drop onto a target like Muradin, flip him back into the fight, and if not for Anduin, he would have fallen. But Anduin, he has only one D right now. And... Oh my god! Muradin! <laughs> And Anduin is going down. Anduin is going down. All right, this time Stukov just had no mercy. Anduin though, falling. Muradin, he survived. So that's that. And yeah, again, they have the boss still up at the top. I don't really think that they can go for the core necessarily. Death timers are always a bit of a problem. There is an inherent defender's advantage. But they can go for boss. And once that they get the boss, they obviously can get the top side keep. Which is essentially what they are now trying to do. Because this thing has already taken damage. The wall is done. As long as they deny the turn in. False that is flying in. <laughs> yeah, mistakes were made. <laughs> they need to get Garrosh out. But yes, turn in can still happen. They're interrupting it for as long as they can. Boss is taken. The usual trade is one team turns in and the other team takes boss. So you trade your gems for boss defense. But now that the boss is already moving through the top lane, they are robbed of that option. So they can't do it. And that was really cool play from the Space Goof. Empowered by Medivh, because without him, they wouldn't have been able to go this deep to interrupt these turn-in attempts. He can provide the portals whenever they need to. So it was really well done by the Space Goofs. You honestly don't see that a whole lot. If a team is willing to sacrifice their gems for a boss defense, they are normally able to make that work. But off we go, up at the top lane. Keep is gonna fall. Light Bomb engage this time, finally connecting with two. But it could be that even that is not enough for them. Horrify already used. They can easily move away from this. And the blue team is now pinned down since they have to defend their core as well. You look at experience. It's a two and a half level lead for the red team. They are having 46,000 damage on Gul'dan with 52,000 for Junkrat. And we have enough gems in just a moment for the red team to get a web weaver wave themselves. And they're also working on their camp, so this, they're really hitting all the things. All the things at the same time. They're going for turn-ins, they're trying to make sure that the blue team doesn't get one, they're taking camps, they are having uh, Medivh just spy on everybody as he's flying around. And so far, yeah, things are looking pretty good. Also, if they get that half level, then they have level 20. But I guess Gok is able to turn in? Yep, so at least they're getting one set of web weavers. So now they got a chance. Now actually they have an opportunity to gain some map control again. Now don't get me wrong, it's not like they're getting the set of web weavers and all of a sudden forts are gonna fall all over the place. But at least they can push the lanes back out a bit. Relieve some of the pressure on the lanes and try and go for fight and kills. Light bomb doesn't connect though. Here's level 20, that makes all of this even worse. And with level 20, we're getting the Mortal Wound. And we're actually getting the Demonic Circle. Look at Gul'dan. A little bit of hibbity hop. Put one already down right over here. So it can always jump out when uh, the shit hits the fan. Web Beavers are being defeated and have been taken out on every single lane. So that was short-lived. But yeah, it's still a desperate attempt of them to make something happen. There's only one way. I mean, honestly, if you are on the side of the Svenskas, the one thing that you're praying for right now is lightning to strike uh, whatever house the, the, <laughs> the space goofs are in so that the electricity goes out because I don't think that you are having a chance unless they are all turning into bots all of a sudden. So, <laughs> unless they are really throwing this, this should be a win for the red team. They have all the drum cards in their hands. They have two keeps destroyed. They have a level 20 advantage. They're two levels ahead. So, their blue team would have to catch up in levels first. Which isn't impossible, but that's also taking a lot of time. And I'm not sure if the space goofs, goofs are going to give them that much. 71 gems in their hands. So, they could go for another turn in. Geo! Uh, uh, Gia 9. Gia goes down. Him is dead, and Anduin should probably fall now too. At least they're chasing him. Marke is trying to rush away. The ley line connects, and they have a chance to get more kills. They're not quite there yet. Horrify against Chen. They're still trying for Marke. Marke is low, but he is running away. Is able to get out, and it's instead Banana H that falls. And Banana H only kicks things off. 
The next one to die is Muradin. That's three heroes down. They're moving in for the rest. And I suppose at this point it's safe to say that the game is over. We have the team that moves on to the grand final. It's gonna be the Space Goofs. Play still wants Marker. And he gets Marker. Anduin is eliminated. At this point we should just call him Anduina. And that's 13 kills to 3. 13 kills to 3. Nicely done. We have... A 2-1 victory for the Space Goofs as they go for the core. There's no way, no way to save this any longer. Only Chen is here. He doesn't even have his keg. Fawcett can gust a little bit. But the catapults that are moving onto the core are already more than enough to end this one. 66% right now. And that's a 2-1 victory. The Svenskars, they take third place in the fourth qualifier for the Banshee Cup. And the Space Goofs move on to the grand final to face off against the Raiders. Nicely done. GG. Well played.